So let's talk about insulin sensitivity for mm -hmm. a minute. And I know in your talk, uh, it was fascinating. You discuss more traditional isolated civilizations, mm. such mm. as the Aborigines, the Maoris, mm. the Pacific Islanders, mm. the Pima Indians. And you explain how they were metabolically healthy mm. and insulin sensitive, mm. and they were able to uh, basically partition energy mm. quite well. Mm. But, it's a topic. yes. Yeah. And, they can run into problems when they're exposed to modern food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit um, about that, Marty. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the time people think because they're obese, they're insulin resistant. I think um, that's where blood sugar testing comes in. And if you've got high blood sugars, you're legitimately insulin resistant. And um, I mean, the craft test would show that people who have got normal blood sugars have probably got may have a lot of insulin circulating. And uh, you know, note says that seventy percent of the community, the Western community, are insulin resistant in some form and, and got the metabolic syndrome. Um, but at the same time, there are some people who actually, I think, through a low-carb diet approach, are able to normalize the blood sugars, probably lower the insulin to a point that they don't need to focus so much on a high-fat ketogenic or exogenous ketogenic diet approach. So I suppose as I looked at those gradients between the different people, looking at people like Simon, I went, wow, this guy was insulin sensitive and managed to pack on weight really quickly and he was also able to drop weight very quickly. So as we talked about before, someone who's uh, insulin resistant, type 2 diabetic, is really controlled by that. Their appetite is controlled by the fact that their ketones don't kick in when they drop their carbohydrates. So they need, they need legitimately need a higher fat diet at, in that transitionary period. But um, yeah, and we're talking on the cruise and, and Simon mentioned, you know, the islanders and the people that survived were the, probably the ones who could get on a boat, use their own body fat for stores, and uh, you know make it to the, that next land, and then fill up, fuel up. Um, yeah. So, did you want to talk about? Uh, yeah. That concept. They had a. Me they were metabolically at an advantage. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It, it meant the survival. So, as they came down, even when you look at how a lot of those Pacific islanders and how those scattered islands start going down, you start getting to places that are almost second, I think, now on the list of mm. the most obese people on the planet, which is in Tonga, and they're very close to near the end of that trail. So it was a real metabolic advantage to be able to make sure that they funnel that energy into fat at time when they actually needed it to be able to survive in times of plenty. And whether or not a lot of that got activated epigenetically as it went through each and every single time, in order for survival you sort of still get mixes of people that sort of have different gradients even within the same family mm. so you have ones that are very good at packing on the weight for storage for later other ones that seem to stay relatively lean it's almost as if different environmental factors cause a bit of a mix within a gene pool and then the ones that survive very well end up surviving well the ones that don't it's sort of balances itself out at the end of the day mm. but you get much more people that are insulin sensitive that are much more prone to gaining weight very very quickly and also being able to mobilize it in times of winter mm. but unfortunately we have no times of winter and mm. we have much more extended daylight cycles than even those islanders used to have so they have much more longer nights they have access to much more western food that would have never even existed on that island a lot of the stuff would have been some sweet fruits that they had outside during the daylight, but not the abundance of all this extra stuff that they pack in tonight. Mm. So mm. they are drawn to those things for survival, but you have that partitioning of energy that some mm. goes into energy and the others get saved for later. So they still feel just as good, but they end up enjoying the dopamine spike that they want to keep on feeding off of it. Mm. So, and they end up feeling hungry because of it. And yeah, gets into a vicious cycle. So the mitochondria start out really healthy. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, feeding your mm. mitochondria mm. and making the shift from using ketones to glucose, mm. and they're able to do that. Mm. And then, in a sense, they row the boat to West, modern Western society, or, or Western society comes to the island, and all hell breaks loose. Yeah. So someone who's insulin sensitive, you talked about nutrient petitioning, I think someone who's insulin sensitive can quickly build muscle. They, they take the protein they eat and it turns to body muscle, um, not as much to fat. But then someone who becomes insulin resistant, 
um, their insulin doesn't work so well, um, they can't produce insulin in response to the, the protein they eat, and that protein then through gluconeogenesis elevates blood sugar, which then can get converted to fat. So it's a real priority to become insulin sensitive. But as you talked about those um, native populations, wherever they're from, who have adapted to survive long famines, long winters, um, they can quickly build the muscle, and uh, but, but if they're exposed to a nutrient-poor environment, a high-energy-density environment, a high-insulin-load environment, they just keep on um, packing on the muscle, and then that turns to body fat, and then they'll become insulin-resistant uh, after a time. Um, Professor Roy Taylor from the UK, who worked with mostly on the 600-calorie diet, he talks about the personal fat threshold. So different people have different points at when they become insulin resistant from insulin sensitive. So someone will um, pack on body fat to a point and then the body fat can no longer um, keep taking that excess energy and it overflows into the bloodstream. Then you get higher um, blood sugars and then you know, insulin resistance and that's a cascade that just collapses. So um, different people, it's interesting, have different metabolic health and different insulin uh, sensitivity, different personal fat threshold that depends on the, the genetic and epigenetic environment, that, uh, particularly I think when these, um, you know, it's, it's tragic, we went to um, Vanuatu and we, we visited this uh, community of people that are living beautifully in the forest off coconuts and the local fish and talked about how they, they school, the, 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 they swarm the fish and catch them like they did hundreds of years ago and uh, just we, 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 we were in awe of these beautiful people from Vanuatu and then you go down into Port Villa and these same same race they're eating coke and junk food and all these western foods and mm. they metabolically fall apart and then Gary Fetke has to go there every year to chop off limbs for these people who have just mm. obliterated themselves with western foods and their metabolic health has, has collapsed so well, um, it's awful. So, and there's sort of the canary in the coal mine. And as yeah. you talked about, the um, part of it is the mitochondria that that they're no longer getting the uh, the nutrition to drive the mitochondria at a really high energy. So they can't keep up with the um, high energy environment. They're not getting enough uh, nutrition from the food they eat. So they keep on looking for more food to get those nutrients that aren't in the Coca Cola or the processed. Mm grains that are so prevalent and so cheap and so easy but so um, damaging for these poor people yeah. and that it's awful what's happening to them but it's really a warning sign for the rest of society that, that it's going to happen to us as well and bankrupt um, western civilization with the medical bills so. what, what a great contrast as to how nutrition can affect mm. your health in a good way mm. and a bad way and just again to mention that you know uh, this is what optimizing nutrition is all about yeah. so so that's your website yeah. you know, social media optimizing nutrition and simon you also have a web presence as well and and it's uh, keto island mm -hmm. keto island and you're on social media and you're going to write a book about your experience you're already working on it yeah from my point of view and my circumstance as a reasonably average healthy person um, you can sort of tell that you fall into that spectrum as if you are on a ketogenic diet or a low fat, high carb diet and you feel amazing while you do it even after a couple of weeks and you still may, may be just as overweight and big as you have been before. It's a very good sign of your metabolic health that you mm. feel really good and you meet a lot of those people around and a lot of them end up finding they feel fantastic on a paleo diet because it's lower in carbohydrate than what they were previously eating and all their energy returns and everything starts feeling fantastic. Yeah. So it's a very good sign of a very healthy, insulin sensitive sort of person. Last two topics. We're gonna discuss intermittent fasting mm. and nitrogen balance. So, oh, wow. so intermittent fasting, is that something that, that you're doing, that mm. you do? Because I know I do that as well. Mm. Yeah, um, I've mucked around with it in the past. I was doing the normal skipping breakfast one, eating later in the afternoon. Um, I've done 24-hour fasts before. I end up doing a lot of it intuitively based on how I feel and based on 
even based on what I want to do during the day, if I want to go out for a long walk, I'm not in a rush to have to eat. Or if I come home late from work, I can easily go and do the food shopping, which is really nice going food shopping and not having that feeling hunger feeling. Mm. And then people end up piling so much stuff because they're mm. hungry. So it's nice having that awesome flexibility of intermittent fasting without hunger. Most people think fasting initially means hunger, but for the most part, it's zero hunger, which is absolutely beautiful. And... Um, yeah, that yeah. Really, I think so. really for me it's just don't eat when you're not hungry and mm. once you can reduce the insulin load drop your blood sugars then you can access your fat stores um, yeah and I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Jason Fong and uh, had a lot of good results when I discovered his work um, started intermittent fasting fairly regularly and recently did a, a seven day fast it just felt fantastic so Right, but that's not something you, the seven day, the prolonged fast, that isn't just something to, to, to an see experiment. if I could do myself. And uh, yeah, right. generally I'll just you know eat later in the afternoon and test my blood, occasionally that's, test my blood sugars to see right. if my energy is dropping. I find that I, I skip breakfast, yeah. uh, especially during the work week. You know, I have mental clarity when I go to um, you know activities, mm. tennis or the, or the gym. Or when you're doing a talk, you're looking for mental clarity. That's, by not eating. that's right you, you saw me do that and uh, hopefully it works yeah. but so it's just you know skipping a meal or two mm. and and then you eat when you're hungry yeah Seafried talks about having a, a, a week-long fast for cancer and right. that purges all the dead um, cancer cells and all the other cells through autophagy but like you're inferring not everybody needs to you know get to a seven day point some people might start with skipping breakfast and then yeah. pushing that first meal out a little bit longer incrementally and the, and the idea is in a 24-hour period of time for instance if you're skipping some meals that's that's mm. kind of how mm. i like to describe meal it skipping. But yeah meal, and, you, and you're keeping yourself hydrated having salt mm. um salts Definitely. and maybe some broth then um uh, yeah it's just it's just helpful but during the uh, when you eat you might actually eat the same amount of calories that you would eat in the 24 mm. hour period of time, but it's the period where insulin is low mm. that you reap the benefit. And potentially because of improved your insulin sensitivity, you're able to better auto regulate your appetite. Mm. So that's the exciting thing. So, how long do you fast? Or is it the same in way that we're doing it, or is it extended? Um. Similar, the, the main thing I personally like to aim for when I am doing my fasting is there's been a lot of research lately about time-restricted eating, about windows of feeding times for optimal sort of cycles and yeah. how that sort of relates with insulin going up and down naturally through the day. So the way that I've been doing it is I try to aim for a nine-hour window when I feed and then the rest of it I'm fasting for when I do my intermittent fasting. Yeah, so I've also... Um, done an extended day fast very similar to Marty with the data points I did an 87 hour fast by the time that I finished which was almost five days mm -hmm. um, and measured my levels continuously to see how I'd gone but that one was more of a personal choice because like we talked about with Thomas Siegfried's mm -hmm. work with the glucose ketone index I sadly lost my mum to breast cancer on Australia Day this year mm -hmm. And after mm. that, that really hit hard to me. And a lot of the research was coming out about how difficult it is for cancer and cancerous cells to be able to survive in that level of a glycolytic state, I guess is the right word. Yeah. So I aimed for what he was referencing for is about the one on the glucose ketone index. So I went to one and then dropped to 0.5 and I maintained that for two wow. days until I finished. And I hadn't repeated that experiment since because it is a very mental commitment to commit yourself to to do an extended fast yeah. and you go through different energy lows and dips as you go through it and then the energy ramps right up but and you feel fantastic but it is a very personal thing to do an extended fast so for the average person the intuitive skipping breakfast and seeing how you feel clarity wise you don't continue yeah. to do something where you don't feel good so mm. so briefly we're all fans of steve finney Yes. And he expresses concerns about negative nitrogen balance. Mm. And what are your thoughts about that? I would like to know yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose his concern is that you're going to lose muscle if you get to a point where uh, you know, you're not eating protein. And uh, I think Steve's got a lot of great things to say about 
the importance of protein in a ketogenic context, so to maintain muscle mass because uh, you know it's your muscle that burns the glucose, it's your ability to, to burn through glucose, glucose disposal that is so critical to metabolic health yeah. and managing diabetes. But um, at the same time, Jason Fung talks about the importance of autophagy and, and cleansing the body and yeah. um, David Sinclair also talks about the magic of fasting, the great things that happen when you fast. Uh, and, and, and I think, personally, my view is that when you fast, you clean out those old dead cells. So if you if you never have a period where you're not going into a negative uh, nitrogen balance or in an energy deficit, you're always building new protein, new muscle on old, you know, degraded, um, you know, bad quality. So you just keep on building new protein on top of old junk. Mm -hmm. So. My view is that it, you get that autophagy, that the, the cell cleansing, you eat your own dead cancerous or, or old tissues. Yeah. And then when you do eat, it's very important to replenish that protein. So over the long term, you get positive, oh, you know, adequate nitrogen balance, adequate protein to maintain muscle mass. So, so whether you do, and when you do it, I think a lot of people um, trying to follow a ketogenic diet, then follow a fast with a therapeutic ketogenic meal which then doesn't build back the protein that they need to build the muscles. Mm. So. so if, oh go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, to break down some of the geek talk, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, the mitochondria is the energy power plants of our body. And if we never had that autophagy or replenishment of brand new mitochondria, it's like running our system off of cars that are like 20, 30 years old. Mm. The car still runs but it parts and doesn't go as well. So by creating that deficit, you end up recycling those cars out of the system yeah. and you create brand new Ferrari cells. <laughs> so the essence of is intermittent fasting the only approach for weight loss? No, but it is a useful tool in order to steps, in order to probably optimize your future nutrition. Is it mm -hmm. gonna be always required? No, but there is aspects where it's going to be on the path of recovery of health for people. So I see it as a matter of semantics. So if you, uh, in, and, and it's, it's, it's intermittent that's important. Yes, intermittent so important. you can um, voluntarily not eat and after a period of time you're going to negative nitrogen balance. Mm. Yes. But, but it's intermittent, it's not prolonged. Correct. And Correct. that's where I think uh, the issue is. Mm. And Overall, it's probably a good thing mm -hmm. to intermittently fast. Yep. So, guys, it's a pleasure to meet you here in, so in the land of Oz, and I hope to come back. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks. Thank you.